From under the Golden Dome in Charleston, this is the West Virginia Capitol Report. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Capitol Report. I'm Bill Laird, and we have a great show lined up today. We've traveled to Lewisburg in the beautiful Greenbrier Valley. We're at the uh, Greenbrier County Visitor Center here in Lewisburg, and we're welcoming our guest today is uh, State Senator Stephen Baldwin, who represents the 10th Senatorial District, which includes Fayette, Greenbrier, Summers, and Monroe Counties. And uh, Senator, really appreciate you joining us today, and welcome to the Capitol Report. Thank you. Glad to be back on the Capitol Report and glad to have the Capitol Report in the Greenbrier Valley. Okay. Well, we'll get uh, right to it. Uh, uh, more recently, I guess, uh, we'll start with the, the, the current news. Uh, the, the legislature, as part of their interim processes, uh, uh, the governor uh, called a special session uh, where the legislature was asked to take up uh, three pieces of legislation uh, recommended for passage by the uh, governor's office. I think uh, two of those three measures did uh, did pass the legislature. So uh, if you could, for our viewers, uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, about that special session and uh, what occurred. Sure. Well, you're right. We had three issues on the call this time. Um, the first one was a technical issue with DUIs. Uh, and essentially, the federal government said, if you don't make this change to match federal law, you're going to lose $10 million. So we quickly said, our mistake, let's fix that. <laughs> Save that $10 million to put it towards it's, some uh, better always usage. a pretty good carrot or stick. Uh, that's a pretty good stick. That's uh, right. That's right. And then another uh, measure was specifically about the road bond. You know, it was a follow-up to the road bond uh, from before. Um, and there was a, a move to try and take $25 million out of maintenance in order to pay, uh, make interest payments for that bond. Um, it was it was somewhat controversial in that um, you know a few of us didn't think that was a very good idea to be taking money out of the road maintenance fund when there are so many road maintenance needs right now. Um, but in the end, um, that did pass, and there were assurances um, from those in power that they're going to try and leverage that into more dollars for road maintenance. Absolutely, and again, I suppose the. The third measure uh, related to, uh, I believe, tax credits uh, on a, a, a program that had been previously established, I think that was due to expire uh, at the end of December, uh, related to tourism in West Virginia. And uh, I guess the Senate passed that measure, but the House, uh, uh, I guess, deferred action in May, which doesn't preclude the possibility of, of doing that in December, but at least did not uh, concur with the Senate on their passage. Is that correct? That's right, yes. And it's a tax credit, essentially, for anybody who's doing a new tourism-based business. Um, and the Greenbrier Valley here in particular, um, New River Gorge Valley have both um, benefited greatly from this in the past, um, as well as up in Pocahontas County has been a huge beneficiary. So it's really important to Southern West Virginia, and I, I, I do hope that that passes moving forward. I think it will. There were just some questions about, you know, who could apply for this and when, who is currently an applicant, and why do we need to do this all of a sudden? You know, if sometimes when you're up there, folks sort of want you to take action real quickly, and it raises the, the hair on the back of your neck a little bit, and you want to know, well, why do we need to do this so fast? You know, let's take our time and make sure we're doing the right thing. Yeah, and again, I guess uh, the purpose of tax credits is to encourage uh, private entrepreneurs to invest or reinvest uh, in uh, tourism-based uh, uh, activities that could uh, contribute to the overall economy of the state. That's right. I mean, these are not handouts. You have to spend money on tourism in West Virginia in order to potentially get a credit on the sales tax that you would pay. So, you know, we're not losing money. We're gaining money in the long run. And the tourism economy has, has been good to West Virginia, especially southern West Virginia. Absolutely. Well, back uh, to roads, and again, that being, uh, you know, sounds to me like a uh, just a, an allocation and moving of monies from an, one account maintenance into uh, uh, other areas. But uh, right. I'm sure as a, uh, unless things have changed, uh, you know, you hear from constituents as it relates to road conditions. Uh, uh, the Roads to Prosperity Amendment, which uh, overwhelmingly passed uh, 
by the voters of the state of West Virginia were were you know primarily dedicated to construction projects, infrastructure, that type of thing. But I guess simultaneous to the availability of that money, uh, a lot of folks uh, you know drive on secondary roads and maintenance, uh, you know potholes, uh, drainage ditches. Uh, those types of things, uh, you, you certainly hear a lot about that from constituents too. So uh, I guess the, the question is, uh, where is the balance as far as monies for you know, new bridges and other types of major infrastructure projects versus those sort of in the, you know, where the rubber meets the road in terms of the conditions of our secondary highways? That's a really good question um, because a lot of folks, I think, just sort of see it as there's roads money and that's all shared equally amongst various projects. That's, that's not the case. You know, um, back in 2017, there was an initiative um, to try and do more to help our roads and that really was in two areas. You had the road bond project, which was for new projects. Um, you have new highway construction, new bridge construction, you know, brand new projects. Um, those don't necessarily, you don't see as many of those in southern West Virginia. Those are where the population is growing, which is further north and in the panhandles. What, what we really need or what I hear about from folks most often is road maintenance, you know, taking care of what we've got already. And so those dollars are not that's not part of the road bond. The bond is for the big new projects. Um, there are more maintenance dollars coming in now because um, vehicle registration fees were right. increased. Right. Um, and so that has allowed us to speed up the schedule, whereas before your road was only scheduled to be repaved, say, every 30 years. Um, you can move that, that schedule up to uh, have it repaved every 20 years. Um, which is a, a long time, but it's a lot better that's, than the alternative. That's, uh, that's exactly right. Well, again, uh, you know, with interims uh, come certain kind of topical considerations. Again, uh, I think it's fair to say in the last few years there's perhaps been a little bit of a de-emphasis on the interim process uh, as a way in which you can kind of flesh out issues and, you know, begin to prepare for the upcoming regular session of the legislature, but laying that aside, uh, uh, did you have any topical uh, issues or concerns in the most recent uh, interim meetings that uh, may be of interest to our viewers? Yes, sir. I think there were several that folks seem to have been taking some interest in recently. Um, uh, one is uh, the, ju the uh, Judiciary Committee had uh, about a two-hour session on prison overcrowding. Um, and you know, you may say prison overcrowding. Well, that doesn't necessarily affect me and my family. It has a huge effect on the state budget of West Virginia as well as counties. You know, county jail bills have increased dramatically over the past decade um, as counties uh, have to deal with uh, the effects of the opioid crisis, and they literally are paying for it with every person that they arrest and, and send um, to jail. So. Um, there were some solutions, some potential solutions suggested there in terms of um, how we can avoid what they called the nu nuclear option, and the nuclear option is having to build an additional jail, wow. which nobody wants to do um, because A, it's financially irresponsible, and B, is it actually helping with our root problem of getting folks out and about and involved in their community again, you know, clean, working good jobs, being productive citizens. So there, there are some ways to do that, um, and so that's, that's what we talked about. Over, I was stunned. Over the past 25 years, um, our prison population has tripled. Wow. Tripled in the state of West Virginia in the past 25 years. And despite a rather level or even in some instances declining population base. Uh, uh, but again, uh, you know, that is... Uh, maybe a, a, a issue that I would almost call a chronic condition. Uh, certainly uh, mm -hmm. uh, prison overcrowding has uh, you know, been around for a while and uh, you know several years ago there was uh, legislation introduced that was intended to you know try to curb that or bend the curve uh, mm -hmm. uh, because I think trajectories were such that uh, that's where we were headed was the construction of a new uh, correctional facility at a cost of tens of millions of dollars but right. uh, uh, you know the uh, the the 
the opioid uh, issue, the nexus between that underlying uh, addiction uh, problem and its connection with uh, criminal conduct and behavior is, uh, I think, uh, undeniable. It's there. And, uh, uh, you know, do, uh, do you think in the last, during your tenure of service, uh, there's a heightened awareness, I think, of the problem, but uh, any, uh, any constructive solutions maybe on the horizon of, uh, you know, how to recognize this as a serious public health crisis and uh, uh, develop some type of uh, capacity to, uh, to treat these, uh, these folks that suffer from this condition? I think there have been a few steps in the right direction, not, not nearly enough to my liking. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, just to give you an example, um, there are, I talk to law enforcement all the time and ask them what percentage of the crime that you deal with on a daily basis is related to drugs. Um, they say between 90 and 95 percent wow. down to a person, all related to drugs. Uh, and so then you look at the economic impact. Uh, WVU says it costs our economy $8.8 .8 billion every year, wow. $8.8 .8 billion a year. I mean, that is the combination of agriculture and coal and tourism, the positive impact they have, it's all wiped out by the negative impact of opioids. Wow. So it's a huge problem. I mean, in terms of what's been done the past couple of years, we have more drug courts than we did several years ago. Um, we have more treatment beds available. We've doubled the number of treatment beds that are available, which is a positive step in the right direction. Um, we have not done any work on prevention. And I think that's an area where you get a big bang for your buck um, and you affect entire lives. You know, you're not just trying to correct a problem that's developed over generations. You're stopping the problem. Um, so I, I hope we can focus attention there. Absolutely. And again, uh, that's, uh, that's one of those underlying problems that uh, impact uh, workforce participation rates. Uh, you know, just so many different ways. It, it fractures families. Uh, yep. You know, a, an alarming figure and something that's been topical in the legislature is the number of children uh, in foster care and uh, kept mm -hmm. by, you know, surrogates outside of the family. Uh, those are those are the social consequences of addiction that are very real in the communities in which we live. Absolutely. It affects every family. Um, it affects every community. doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, old or young, black or white. It uh, doesn't matter. It yeah. does not discriminate. Absolutely. Well, again, uh, the, uh, and you're, you're right about uh, the, the prison over <clears throat> population rate. I, I hear from, you know, county commissioners and other folks that have the, the real difficult task of trying to maintain solvency in uh, local units of government that uh, truly regional jail bills are uh, budget busters and uh, again with uh, you know b relatively stable revenue sources at counties it it uh, it can uh, it can bankrupt our counties mm -hmm. it's uh, that's tough well senator I, I hope you'll stay with us uh, for our second segment a couple other issues we'd like to get into but again uh, if you're able to do so we're going to go ahead and take a quick break and be right back to the capitol report so stay with us everybody Stay tuned. The West Virginia Capital Report will be right back. The West Virginia Capital Report is brought to you by the AFL-CIO of West Virginia, Cucumber and Company, online at cucumberandcompany.com, and Mark Hunt and Associates, toll free at 800-554-1280. From under the Golden Dome in Charleston, this is the West Virginia Capitol Report. Welcome back to the Capitol Report as we continue our discussion with Stephen Baldwin, a senator from the 10th Senatorial District. And, uh, uh, Senator, the, you know, as we speak, there are census uh, folks moving around in communities, uh, beginning to gear up for the official 2020 uh, census uh, that occurs every 10 years across this nation and uh, one of the really important parts of government is uh, uh, sort of the redistricting or apportioning the population and aligning it to the principles of uh, 
you know, one man, one vote uh, kind of uh, distribution of, uh, of our population uh, in the state of West Virginia. And again, uh, some predictions with the trending of our population, we may be losing one of our, our three congressional seats, uh, but a lot of consequences to that uh, uh, redistricting process. But uh, one of the duties and responsibilities uh, assigned to our state legislatures are the, uh, the the redistricting process and uh, again that occurred uh, following the 2010 census so I assume in 2021 which is still I guess uh, out about a year but uh, you know the, the 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 legislature I think has to sort of gear up and get ready for redistricting uh, anything to report in on that front do you have a sense uh, you know, what that process may consist of, whether there may be public hearings. Uh, but I guess, you know, with computer software, there's lots of ways those uh, things can kind of be made uh, more objective. But uh, if you could, just for our viewers, uh, tell us a little bit about redistricting. Yeah, well, this is a sort of civics lesson time. I mean, right. I, I think a lot of folks don't realize how this works um, and or how important it is. But to me, what it comes down to is, I need to know who my representative in government is. Right. You know, if you're a citizen, you need to know who's representing you uh, when you pass by them in Kroger or on the street, and you need to have some consistency about that and not any sort of question about, oh, well, are you in this district or that district or who represents me or who represents my neighbor? There's got to be clear consistency. Um, and we're fortunate here, I think, in the 10th Senatorial District, we've got just you know four counties. It's inclusive of four total counties, and so it's pretty easy for folks to know who their senators are, for example. Um, the delegate districts are a little bit different. You know, we're divided up. They divide up portions of counties, and even some of the senatorial districts, they will cross the span of the state of West Virginia, a small sliver of, you know, six different counties. And how does anybody know who their representatives are? Um, so what I'm leading to is that's why it's important. and. Uh, the folks who are in charge of doing that are the legislature. Um, and it has always been a partisan process. Mm -hmm. When the Democrats were in control, the Democrats controlled redistricting. The Republicans are in control at this point. If they were to still be in control, then they would control redistricting. I had a proposal last year um, to make redistricting nonpartisan. So it wouldn't matter who was in charge, Republicans or Democrats. I, ought it ought, I thought it ought to be a nonpartisan process so that it was strictly based on um, making the numbers work, making the geography work so that I know who my representatives are uh, and it's not, you know, some weird cutout of a county. Um, that, that failed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not going to be a nonpartisan process. It will be partisan, which makes the elections important. Absolutely. And, uh, and again, I guess, uh, you know, things like gerrymandering where you manipulate uh, boundary lines, uh, you know, based on such things as party affiliation and making, uh, you know, certain districts uh, more safe for incumbents, uh, a lot of things that I guess can kind of contaminate that process. But again, uh, uh, the 10th Senatorial District in particular uh, consisting of four whole counties, I think it may be the only senatorial district in the state of West Virginia where it wasn't necessary to fracture counties and send them in two different directions. That, mm -hmm. uh, uh, oftentimes referred to as a perfect district, perhaps, but uh, the 10th senatorial district is the perfect district. You know, I, I think uh, <laughs> I think as the expression goes, you represent heaven in the West Virginia legislature, my friend. Amen. But, uh, Amen. Uh, but again, uh, you know, the the composition of the body uh, it's always important, and uh, it seems like uh, more so recently, uh, you know, folks uh, kind of don't put as high a premium on you know, knowledge and experience. Uh, sometimes I think uh, folks feel frustrated and uh, perhaps change for the sake of change tends to uh, sweep uh, incumbents out of office. A lot of people advocate for term limitations, those types of things. But uh, uh, pretty recently uh, some decisions were made by longstanding members of the Western United States Senate uh, who chose uh, uh, not to run again. Uh, again, uh, you know, sometimes enough indeed may be enough, but uh, one of those is the uh, uh, the current uh, minority leader of the 
uh, the West Virginia State uh, Senate, uh, uh, Roman Prozioso from Marion County. Uh, I think he had prior service in the House of Delegates uh, before his tenure in the State Senate, uh, former chair of uh, the Senate Health Committee, the Senate Finance Committee, uh, you know, truly a knowledgeable and experienced uh, member of the West Virginia State Senate, in addition to uh, Senator Cory Palumbo, who also uh, previously uh, served uh, in the House of Delegates prior to his tenure in the Senate, but I think uh, completing his third uh, four-year term or 12 years in the State Senate, including a uh, period of time as chairman of the powerful Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, uh, you know, a lawyer by trade, but uh, you know, those are those are knowledgeable and experienced uh, veteran members of a legislative body. Uh, uh, if you could maybe just uh, reflect a little bit, uh, you know, on their service and uh, maybe, you know, from your perspective, uh, how important is institutional knowledge and experience uh, as it relates to the whole process itself and, uh, you know, what do we lose uh, when we lose folks like that? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. I mean, I've, I've had the good fortune to serve with Roman and Corey for the past two years, and they're both just very reasonable guys. Um, they they have a, a cool head about the whole process simply because they know it. You know, I, as a new guy, I'm a, my head's occasionally spinning a little bit because I'm trying to make sure I've, I'm where I'm supposed to be and doing what I'm supposed to do and have the rules down and all that. Well, you know, if you have somebody with institutional memory and knowledge, um, that comes naturally to them at that point, and they're able to focus their time and their energy on, on legislating and on serving. Um, so I certainly think something will be missed um, without them there. At the same time, I, I do think, in a general sense, it's it's healthy to have some turnover and some change for the benefit of democracy to, you know, have some folks there who have brand new ideas. Um, some folks who have some experience and some folks with a tremendous amount of institutional memory so that in the mix of that together um, you can hopefully do your best to serve your people. Absolutely and again uh, you know diversity within the body uh, people come from various walks of life uh, you know I think uh, Senator Prozioso was uh, uh, dealt with public education as a, a career professional there and again Senator Palumbo's uh, background in the legal profession. Everybody sort of brings their life's experience to the process and it's the blend of that uh, uh, that diversity that I think uh, strengthens the fabric of a of a legislative body. And sure, sure. Certainly their their services will be missed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, moving on uh, again a, a topical issue that I know uh, I followed uh, your interest in this and uh, uh, that interest, I think, was uh, just born as a result of your geographic representation of a, an area of the state that was really devastated, uh, you know, with uh, floods that occurred, uh, uh, really just, uh, you know, devastated uh, certain areas in Greenbrier County, in Fayette County, uh, some of those areas uh, certainly susceptible to, you know, the, the types of uh, weather changes and conditions that we have. and. Uh, Again, the the response to that flood, uh, not only the the initial uh, acts of first responders, uh, but the, the recovery process itself. And as a result of that, uh, the legislature uh, created a, uh, I guess, a committee on flooding, of which uh, you are a member. And uh, uh, if you could, for our viewers, uh, maybe just update us a little bit about the, the important work of that committee and from your perspective, uh, you know, what, what progress are we making? Where do we still need to go? Because uh, one thing for sure, uh, that isn't the last uh, uh, emergency that we'll see of that type. And uh, we want to learn from that experience uh, so we're better positioned next time. Uh, where are we on that? That's the idea, yeah. We want to be prepared next time because it's not a matter of if it's going to happen again. It's a matter of when it will happen again. You know, my, my grandmother has lived through a 100-year flood, a 500-year flood, and a 1,000-year flood at wow. this point. And wow. so these things, unfortunately, are happening more and more often. You know, since we've been here, I've seen that I've uh, received text messages from folks who are checking on their particular projects that they're still trying to finalize after three and a half years. Um, 
there has been some good news. Um, I think since the National Guard has taken over, the RISE program has made steps in the right direction. Home construction has increased. Um, to the degree that folks who are waiting on homes would like, no. Um, better than it was before, yes. Um, so there are, there are several hundred homes in the construction phase now. I believe over 300 homes in the construction phase. However, being in the construction phase does not mean you're a month or two away from being in your home. Right. It is a long process. So we heard um, from the folks who are doing that work uh, this week that they think they can have a majority of the homes done by the fall of 2020. Wow. The West Virginia Capital Report is brought to you by the AFL-CIO of West Virginia. Cucumber and Company, online at cucumberandcompany.com and Mark Hunt and Associates, toll free at 800-554-1280. Welcome back to the Capitol Report as we close out today's program. And again, our special guest today is Senator Stephen Baldwin from the 10th Senatorial District, uh, constituting Greenbrier, Fayette, uh, Monroe, and Summers County. And Again, I had an opportunity to discuss the recently concluded uh, special session of the West Virginia Legislature, a variety of different issues uh, uh, with Senator Baldwin, but uh, very clear that Senator Baldwin is a man who takes his responsibilities uh, of representing uh, the citizens of that, those four counties in the West Virginia Legislature, and again, topical concerns related to flooding, emergency response, and some of the structural issues, the work of some of the interim and regular committees in which he serves in the West Virginia Senate. So again, to our viewers, we'd like to thank you all for tuning us in each week on the West Virginia Capitol Report. Thanks for tuning us in. Have a good week and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>